So the next piece is about uh, Australia announced that they're having a COVID inquiry. The Australian government is going to investigate itself and it finds it did nothing wrong. Um, so our Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announced that there would be a COVID inquiry to consider Australia's responses to the pandemic. Um, and it excludes actions taken unilaterally by state and territory governments. Uh, okay, so they said that there's going to be a one-year inquiry headed by epidemiologist Professor Catherine Bennett, health economist Dr. Angela Jackson, and former Director General of the New South Wales Health Department, Robin Crook. So a lot of people criticize that as a complete waste of time because if the states can't be compelled to give evidence, it you know, it would be absurd. What's the point? What's the point? Um it it's a toothless investigation. But what do you expect when the government investigates itself, right? Um so here, this article from The Guardian talks about how the proposed scope includes the role of the Commonwealth, responsibilities of state and territory governments, and national governance mechanisms, inclu including the national cabinet. So during the lockdowns and stuff, there was a national cabinet uh, where uh, different state uh, premiers, late, their leaders, met to discuss how they wanted to do lockdowns and whatnot and what methods they want to do. So potential topics for the inquiry include vaccine supply, broad, broader health health supports for people affected by COVID-19 and or lockdowns, um, financial support for individuals, industry and businesses, community supports, international policies to support Australians at home and abroad, mechanisms to better target future responses to the need needs of particular populations including first nations australians so the but the scope excludes actions taken unilaterally by state and territory governments which would exclude state border closures and could exclude the length and severity of lockdown restrictions and international programs and activities assisting foreign countries. So someone asked if the length of the lockdowns will be considered, and Albanese told the reporters the three inquiry heads can look at whatever they like, quote. Uh, that is point of it that is the point of an independent inquiry, he says. He said he wanted a process of learning from the pandemic that is constructive rather than destructive. So basically they don't want criticism. Um, they want to make sure this is forward focused and consider all of the Commonwealth responses to the pandemic. Forward focus. Let's shove things under the carpet. Yeah. You know, what's the point of not, you know, talking about the length and severity of the lockdowns? That's not an investigation. Dan Andrews locked down Victoria for the longest time. They had one of the worst lockdowns in the world. Um, and they kept extending, extending it after extension. People were going crazy because they've been locked up for months on end. And it was really inhumane. Um, so... <sighs> The reporters asked if participation will be compulsory, including state leaders. And Albanese said, I should imagine that everyone will want to participate in this. So that implies that that's voluntary, that they won't be compelled to show up. So the final report will be delivered on the 30th of September. And he's, Albanese said a shorter inquiry was favored. Because, quote, a lot of the work has already been done. There have been 20 different inquiries. <sighs> so.
So during his election, um, Albanese said that he would do a COVID inquiry. I don't know why anyone believed him because the government, again, investigating itself after being bought out, they're not going to do that. It would go against their interests. So uh, the opposition leader, Peter Dutton, said that Australians would be stunned to learn that premiers who were responsible for lockdowns were excluded from the inquiry. He labeled it as a protection racket for Dan Andrews and Anastasia Palachuk, so the Victorian Premier and the Queensland Premier. But they weren't the only ones locked down. Mark McGowan was super tyrannical. Our New South Wales person, Gladys and um, Dominic, they were pretty tyrannical. Like They were pretty similar, even though uh, New South Wales is was a liberal state um, before the previous election. Um, even though they were liberal, the opposition, they were really similar. They might not have like locked down as extreme, for example, as Victoria. Victoria was like the worst one, but they were essentially pushing for the same thing. They justified what they did. So yeah, it was a cop out, massive, massive cop out. Um, so this article, uh, the shadow health minister said it was a cop out because it excluded uh, the exclusion of the states and territories. And they said, many of the de decisions that were made during the pandemic by the states and territories are the ones that probably impacted Australians the most, she said. Wh whether that be the lockdowns, border closures, mandates, and the like, which all had very significant impact on Australians. So, yeah, it's super, um, it's super dodge. And, and, uh, some of the, uh, someone here said, like, they wanted to look at, they wanted to examine improvements to the national medical stockpile, supplies of vaccines, and personal protective equipment. And it's important to have, that forward focused planning work. So what did we learn? Can we avoid not having enough vaccines when we need them? Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's not like they're trying to suggest, like they're just gonna investigate like the forward planning aspect and say like, oh, we need more vaccines. Australian government had an excess of vaccines. If you look back, um, there was like lots of news articles saying how much they spent on the vaccines and um, how much excess that wasn't used. Sorry, my camera's just getting out of focus. Um, yeah, but I mean, is anyone surprised by that? <laughs> So I've got the government website here. I found it through the Guardian article. There were some links and I had to click through. Uh, so this is the Commonwealth Government COVID-19 response inquiry in terms of reference. So it talks about their scope and what lessons they learned to improve Australia's preparedness for future pandemics. Sorry, I'll just zoom in. It's quite small text. So scope is that they want to recommend and improve response measures. They say they will adopt a whole of government view in recognition of the wide ranging impacts of COVID-19. So they specify things like here, responsibility of, whoops. Uh, sorry, responsibility of state and territory governments, national governments mechanisms, and advisory bodies supporting responses to COVID-19, key health response measures like vaccinations and treatments, quarantine facilities, public health messaging, broader supports for people impacted by COVID-19 and or lockdowns, for example, mental health and suicide prevention supports, uh, international policies like international border closures, vaccine supply, oh, sorry, vaccine supply, uh, support for industry and businesses, financial support for individuals, so COVID stimulus checks, for example, 
community supports, mechanisms to better target future responses. And then here you go. The following areas are not in scope for the inquiry. Actions taken unilaterally by state and territory governments, international programs and as activities assisting foreign countries. <laughs> So there you go. Uh, they've excluded themselves, basically. <laughs> Nuts. So Australia's uh, government's a clown world. Big time. Big time clown world. Okay, so speaking of vaccination, this is why I stream on Odyssey and not YouTube, because we would have been demonetized very early. So I've got... Um, a story, vaccine injury story from Jab Injuries Australia. We try to watch, uh, watch most of it, but it's quite long, so it might not be able to get the get to the ending. And because it's an Instagram reel, it's it won't let me scroll through, and it's hard to pause as well. So, uh, this is Darius's story from Jab Injuries Australia. Sorry, give me a sec. I was dumbfounded. First, I was dumbfounded because I was fairly healthy several months before that. A month before that. Fairly healthy, you know what I mean? You told me my heart is like a 99 year old with five issues. Right now, as it sits, 19 days after my second shot. It took about maybe six months, seven months to sink in. My name is Darius Poucher. I am 42 years of age. I am full-time employed. I do app sailing. I work off ropes. We do oh. repaints, oh, cement go. rendering, just fixing buildings. Yeah, so I migrated to Australia in 1992. Ooh, it's lagging quite it a lot. It was after we had independence with Russia. Sorry, guys. I went to school here. Um, also went to school there. But mainly did my year 10 here. I did my year 11 here. And I thought to myself, school is not for me. And I rather, I made a choice, stay in school, do something maybe with computers or hands-on. So I decided to, yeah, I decided to basically go in construction uh, so i started first i did my carpentry apprenticeship in 97. several years later i found out that cement rendering was more money so i started doing cement rendering and uh, had my business for five six years and then i decided to try something else and do rope access because i was just getting tired of you know, doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, so this guy's so yeah, so now be I've been doing shape. rope access since two thousand beginning of two thousand twenty one. I've never had any health issues since I was a kid. I've had a flu when I was younger, temperature, uh back in Lithuania, uh is very cold there, so temperature is very common. I had a Car accident in 2018, I think it was. I broke my back in five places. Liverpool Hospital thought I might have internal bleedings because I rolled my car, engine first and so forth, landed on the roof. And so they gave me a dye inside my body in 2018 to check for any internal bleedings, for any ruptures of any arteries, veins, anything like that. Everything came back clear. In New South Wales, there was a mandate for everyone to cease working in construction and to get yeah. one and second shot uh, by certain dates to continue working. Uh, so me and my boss, I'm not anti-vax, well, I sort of am now, but I wasn't <laughs> then. Uh, like I many trusted of the us. government in their research. I trusted the government in their lab tests and whatever they were feeding us, I've trusted them to look after me. Financially, I couldn't stay at home because I'm young, i financially not stable enough to yeah. go on Centrelink. Um, so uh, the decision was made to a lot of people. go and get myself vaccinated like everyone else that wanted to continue 
employment in New South Wales. I had two vaccinations of Pfizer um, at New, uh, Newtown Hospital. So I had my first shot around June. And then six weeks later, I had my second shot of Pfizer as well at Newtown Hospital. Uh, the first shot, like I said in my last interview, it was drove me like really bad. I uh, lost my balance within six hours, I believe it was. I couldn't, yeah. couldn't walk straight. If you gave me a sobriety test, like in the United States, I would have failed. Um, I lost my voice after three, four days, five days. A um, little bit sick, but that was the side effects that was, I was told to expect. The second shot was, this is where I fell in a bit of trouble. Uh, 19 days after my second shot, I had my first heart attack. It was the 27th, Dude. I believe. I did not go into hospital. It was a Wednesday. I, Wednesday or Thursday, anyways. I did not go into hospital because I didn't know what a heart attack felt, felt like. Uh, what happened was it was raining that He's day, so, so we had a day off. Like and, and I picked up him, two set of dumbbells. Healthy. Like I said, to you, I used to go to the gym and ride pushbacks and walk. What? Yeah. And I picked up two, two dumbbells, one, two, three, put them down. And the chest, the, the pain, the crippling pain that I had was like immense, unbelievable. It was so big that I had to lay down, which I did. I laid down, I looked at the news. It was overcast, raining in the morning. And I thought, what a bad day to die. And this is exactly what I thought. And I got up, because oh, when you have a heart attack, it tells you one of the symptoms, you feel doomed. Like, and that's what I felt like, I felt like doomed. And I got up and by getting up, that made me throw up outside. And so I called my cousin, I said, listen, mate, we had a, a walk that was booked between me and him for 12 kilometers, I think it was. And I said, listen, I think I just had a heart attack, mate, but I'll come down and explain to you what happened. And Let's go for a walk still, you know. So during the walk, I was uncomfortable again. The pain came back, not as much, but it came back. And I remember my cousin, who was my boss as well, uh, said to me, listen, like, what's going on? How are you feeling? What happened? And the pain was so severe. I said, please don't talk to me right now. You know what I mean? So I brushed him off, went back home. I was really under the weather. I was sweating a lot. I uh, didn't feel myself. Um, sore arm, shooting pain. Um, I made a phone call to the Heart Institute, I believe it was, on the 26th or 27th. The reason I rang them is to find out what a heart attack feels like, because I've never had one. So they never, I left a message, they never called me back. Um, during the night, I woke up, I think it was 12, 1, 3, 4, every 2, 3 hours with chest pains. What the doctor was trying to tell me as I was having minor heart attacks during the whole night as well. And uh, yeah, I got dressed just like I am now Thanks. in the morning, 27th or 28th. And uh, sat in my car, five minutes into me driving, I got a massive heart attack again. I didn't ring the ambulance, I this rang up the nurse from St. George Hospital. I'm so glad he hasn't and I died. I explained goodness. to her my symptoms. And I said, look, shooting pain, can't breathe right now. In fact, I couldn't talk. Like I just stopped talking. She told me to please turn my car off and that she, to tell me my location to her and that she thought I was having a heart attack. Not to drive and if it was okay for her to call the ambulance. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Called the ambulance and I called my boss because abseiling, it takes two to abseil. It's illegal to, for one person to do it. So I called, it was only me and the, him on that job in Newtown. So I called him up and I said, listen, mate, they told me to turn the car off. Like it's the same symptoms from yesterday. And they called the ambulance for me. So he arrived before the ambulance came. And back then the coronavirus was like, everyone was scared, everyone was wearing masks. So ambulance came, my boss came, ambulance came, they told me to put a mask on. I did, left my car at the service station. And um, yeah, they hooked me up to a lot of machines and they, on the way to the hospital, they said, no, oh, mate, everything looks fine. The vital signs are fine. Like, 
I don't think you're having a heart attack. Yeah. Okay. I was happy. Called my boss. Said, Mate, I'll see you in a couple of hours. I'll, I'll, as soon as they discharge me, I'll get in my car and I'll, I'll meet you down there. As soon as I got to emergency, I saw a nurse, RM, uh, she's allowed to give medication. And she, she looked at me once and she goes, he's having a heart attack, put him on blood thinners. Now, I don't know whether she spoke to a doctor to put me on blood thinners, but her saying that, the, another, doc, another nurse put me on blood thinners, in, uh, liquid. And uh, the blood test came back within 20 minutes and I was leaking blood and protein inside my heart. That was the strong indication of a heart attack. Sheesh. Yeah. I was rushed to emergency and uh, I, they put a first. Yeah, I, um, I can't watch the full thing because I, I watched it yesterday and it just like, I had cried like multiple times throughout the stories. Jab Injuries did a great job. That was very good editing and like really well put together. Great interview. Really good to hear that guy's story. Um, basically, Darius, that, that man in the interview, he said he ended up getting five stents put in because of the, um, his arteries were so, uh, blocked and damaged. Um, he had multiple heart attacks. He still struggles with the pain because they, they couldn't put in more stents because it would cause the other stents to collapse in his heart. Uh, so they basically told him, um, that he would have to live with the pain. Um, and it was really, the really sad part was that, um, he was told, uh, basically he wouldn't live very long. Um, the doctor said that he had the heart after his injury, like the surgeons and the doctors told him like, he has the heart of a 90 something year old man. Uh, and they would try their best to try to make him live to 60. So he wouldn't even, uh, it, they think, you know, they told him it was unlikely for him to live past 60. Um, and it really weighed heavily on his mind. You know, he, he talks about how at first it made him very depressed and suicidal and how he, you know, has already planned like his funeral and that he thinks he will pass away before his own mom passes away. Uh, and it, he's kind of like mentally prepared for that um which was just like devastating this guy is so healthy and fit and then later he even talks about how his doctors because there was just so much evidence like this guy was really fit he was you know walking like 12k with people beforehand um didn't have any history of uh health issues and stuff like that and you know he just developed this a heart problem after and like <sighs> clearly was caused by the vaccine he, his doctors said you know it's too much of a coincidence this was caused by it so the doctors in his case which is, is good compared to some other vaccine injury cases they actually you know wrote the documents wrote out the medical forms and stuff submitted the report to the um uh vaccine injury uh data uh, system and a report because they had to legally they said we have to do this we have to report this and the guy said he he felt really disappointed uh, when he mailed in all those forms that doctors you know medical notes uh, hospital uh, history and um, hospital forms uh, his how it affected his work and ability to work uh, and, you know, caused him a lot of, like, financial problems because of the vaccine. Um, you have to submit all these documents when you try to get compensation for the COVID vaccine injury uh, scheme. And he sent all those documents. He said he weighed all those documents because he had to post them. It was almost one kilo of, of documentation. It was like 900-something grams. A kilo of paperwork. He has so much evidence. And... His case got rejected. They, they, they just told him like that it wasn't caused, you know, by the vaccine that he wouldn't be covered. 
Um, so he was really upset and felt super like, I guess, I, I think he, he, he felt quite betrayed by the government that, you know, they would just leave people out like that to, to dry. The guy's been in hospital so many times. Like, I really encourage you guys to watch the full story. I'll link it in the description um, below, but it's just heartbreaking. Like, this poor guy, like, he had to actually move that apartment that he was filming in, he actually moved there to be closer to the hospital because he, he just kept having to go to the hospital and he's still, you know, getting heart pain, uh, sharp pains in his chest and just struggling with health issues and his mortality, like, is on his mind a lot. He had to get pets to help with his mental health because it gave him a sense of, like, purpose and having to take care of something else. Um, it was just so sad and you can see how devastating that injury was to this guy's um, physical health, mental health, just his whole life trajectory, you know, is, is changed forever. Um, I, I don't want to be too black -pilled. I personally think, you know, there are some methods that can help back injure people if you go to for example jab injuries australia's website uh and their instagram page um they have stories where people have you know tried different things and and improved a little bit you know um, but it's still quite difficult because everyone's different and everyone's body is different um but i i think it's really difficult for vaccine injured people to have hope because they just get abandoned the medical like this luckily this guy's doctors you know took him seriously and actually reported the injury unlike other stories but for a lot of jab injured people even their doctors try to gaslight them they tell them they have anxiety it's all in their head um they tell them to get psychiatric help they're basically telling them they're crazy even though they're having like physical symptoms um right in front of you it's kind of like the um ambulance people the way they treated darius in his story at least according to him how they said oh he's fine you, you're not having any problems and it took a nurse at the hospital to just look at him to be like this guy's having a heart attack get him on blood thinners um so unfortunately a lot of that stuff still happens in the um way that vaccine injured people are treated i think we should yeah talk about them um these people are people you know like they're not just numbers you can't just leave them after what happened so dumb 